coming up on this week's Salt and Sauce Chat Show. I really think all women should get involved. But when you look at what's been happening in Scottish politics in the last year or so and the last few weeks, I mean, it's really difficult because I want my own daughter who's 15 to get into this. And actually, I was really delighted that the SNP have kind of put mechanisms in place to get more BAME women. But I would like to see more mechanisms to get lone parents in place. Girls who haven't been to uni but have run small businesses or who have juggled a household budget. How do we get those women involved? Scottish politics at the moment, there's this really weird kind of mixture of salmon supporters, indie supporters. They're mixing with the kind of unionist support to pressurise Nicola Sturgeon into doing something. But I think if the SNP and the Greens pull in an independent, an indie majority at Holyrood, it will be inevitable and it will be within the next year or two. Welcome along to another episode of the Salt and Sauce Show. I'm David Simmons and my guest tonight, it's an absolute privilege to have ex-SNP councillor, current SNP party member, the lovely Rosa Zambonini. Thanks very much for coming Hi. on. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. No, you're very welcome. Um, I, I, I want to touch on things just now. What's your current role within the politics world, Rosa? Well, I'm a staffer for James Dornan, who is the MSB for Cathcart. I'd say I'm an activist, maybe not as active as we'd like to be at the moment. No one is. Um, and probably just a mouthy girl on Twitter. <laughs> so how, how did you get involved in the politics world? Was it always something you wanted to go into? or No, and I think that's why it's been an interesting ride for me. Um, it wasn't something I'd ever... I was always quite politically minded. I was interested in what was going on around me. And then I was married and had a divorce at 23, which is pretty young. And I was on my own with two kids. And I remember after the independence referendum... And I don't know if you remember when Scotland got all these MPs, the SNP had this massive swathe of MPs. We had a councillor vacancy and everyone was saying, oh, it should be this type of person. It should be that type of person. And there was a lot of talk then about austerity. That was the big buzzword and how it affected low parents and low income people. I was like, that's me. I'm, I'm that girl. And then someone said, so, well, why don't you know, the MP that was elected in Motherwell and Wisha left a vacancy in my ward and I was saying, well, I mean, it better be something good. So someone said, why don't you do it? And I did. And I was elected within about six months of ever joining a political party. So it was very strange. Well, I mean, you make it sound so easy, but how do you how do you get the ball rolling? How do you make that first step to become a politician and then put your name forward for votes? How does that all come about? And I think, I think that's the complicated part and it puts off a lot of women, especially from participation. I mean, I used to think everybody that was political had been to university or they'd studied or, but, you know, get involved, even if you don't want to join the party, you know, get involved in local activities, leaflet, you know, ask around. If you find a party that you feel that you want to affiliate yourself with, join that party, go to a branch meeting. And then eventually you just see how it works gradually. And there'll be issues that you'll be more sort of, that'll be more your thing than others. And that's okay. It's okay to say, well, actually, I'm not that great on this, but I'm interested in that. And I think that also puts people off. A lot of women especially think, well, I don't know about the economy or social reforms or things like that, but that's okay. I'll get involved. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned that there, especially women. I mean, would you recommend the politics world to more women to get involved? Uh, well, <laughs> So, you know, sometimes that's a difficult question for me because sometimes I would say, yeah, absolutely. And and I really think all women should get involved. But when you look at what's been happening in Scottish politics in the last year or so in the last few weeks, I mean, it's really difficult. Would I want my own daughter who's 15 to get into this? I don't know. But I, I think there is a definite place for women. And there's definitely a place for women like me who didn't have an interest in politics, but they're in hairdressers cutting hair or they're doing makeup or they're working on an Etsy business or they're working in a bank um, and there's a place for these type of women as well as the Joanna Cherries or Nicola Sturgeons in this world there really is so one half of me says yeah go for it and the other half of me says oh be wary <laughs> yeah I mean just to, to reply to that I mean I want to quote something that the Daily Record 
published in 2017. Um, I think it was a quote by you. When I took the by-election in 2015, I believed it of all my heart that a single mum from the scheme could be anything she wanted to be. I still do, however. Uh, we have a long way to go though when it comes to being a woman in politics. What, what exactly did you mean by that statement, Rosa? Well, you know, when I got in there, I thought people would be interested in what I had to say. I thought, and, I, and I've got a lot to say sometimes. I'm aware. I'm, I, I speak. Um, but I thought people would be interested in what I had to say. I thought they would be interested in how I had survived as a lone parent at a young age. That's what I thought. The first story that I ever read about myself was during my by-election, and it was in the Express, and it was about my handbag. And it was about what I was holding my hand. So what they had done was they put together a piece about my value. And the value wasn't about my experience, about what I'd overcome. It was about what I was wearing. It was about my shoes, my handbag, the phone that was in my hand. And that's where it started. And then it was about my lips. And then it was about my cheeks. And then it was about my hair, which I'm not ashamed of. I'm not, I mean, this, this ain't real, but I'm okay with that. But it wasn't who I am, and I didn't want to be othered. I didn't want to be the blonde girl, the girl with the big lips. And I didn't, I didn't quite realise that that people were going to be so intrigued by this, this kind of the look thing. I just didn't think they would be that interested, and they were. It's it's quite refreshing. To, I mean, obviously, here you say that because what I mean by that is I done an interview recently with uh, Lorna Slater, who's joint head of the Greens Party. She advised yeah. that the, the world of politics is crying out for more women, for more people from all walks of life, whether that be race, sexuality, disabilities, all different backgrounds. I mean, you've just kind of said that there that obviously you were maybe pigeonholed by not falling into that category as being what people have in their their head as being a standard MSP, if you like. Um, do you think that's the case, that, that, that there is room, there is scope for people from all different races, different ages, sexualities, abilities, to be a politician, to be involved in politics? Yeah, and absolutely. And that's what we need because that's the world we live in. And I remember what, I remember a long time ago tweeting something about I'd been watching the Kardashians and the onslaught of abuse I got from people I knew, oh, what the hell are you watching that for? What are you doing this? What are you doing? And I was like, People who pay their taxes, who go to the polls and vote, who shop in our shops and are part of our economy, they watch these TV programmes. They get their hair done, they have their lips done, and they're interested in their communities. And it's that attitude of, you know, and I'm, I'm not saying like I'm some sort of victim here, I'm not. But what I'm saying is that we, like Lorna has said, we want more women, but I sometimes have a feeling we want a certain type of woman. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think That's so, yeah. And, and I think that actually we want more um, women. And here's another thing that I noticed when I was a counsellor. I was very keen to work with um, BAME, the BAME community, women within the BAME community, because you do find, like, Hums is great. I love him. And, you know, I love even an ass. We, we have our moments, you know. But he's brilliant. But, again, they're men, and they're, they're, they're men who are well-known within their community, but we need to see more women. And actually, I was really delighted that the SNP have kind of put mechanisms mechanisms in place to get more BAME women. But I would like to see more mechanisms to get lone parents in place. Girls who haven't been to uni but have run small businesses or who have juggled a household budget. How do we get those women involved? Where's the category for them? Yeah, I mean, is there like hurdles that they need to, to jump over to, to get that? Because surely, like you say, you said you watch the Kardashians. That makes you more relatable to Joe Public. I mean, that makes that makes me want to go and vote for somebody like you that's similar to me, not somebody that lives in the centre of the city and the big penthouse apartments and all that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like somebody that I can actually relate to. I, I mean, what sort of hurdles are in the way of, of women of these different sort of don't quite fit the niche, if you like? Well, I think sometimes, sometimes it can be as simple as language. You know, I've got girls, I own a small business, a, a salon, and the salon, the reason I uh, own the salon isn't because I'm a hairdresser, I'm not, but I wanted to employ women and then encourage them into other things, and I thought that would be a good way to do it. And they are interested they, all the time, and one of the things that they have to ask me a lot is, what does that mean? What does that mean? And politicians quite often speak in phraseology that I don't even know. I remember, I remember when I started working for James, there's three very intelligent men work beside me and they're lovely guys. And they used to teach me a word of the week. And I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm inarticulate, but 
you know, they would say, well, this is the word for you. This, do you remember when it was Dickensian? Everything it was Westminster was doing was Dickensian. And I was like, what the, is, what does that mean? Like, what is Dickensian? What even is that? Or draconian? That was another one. I'm like, so language, language can be a barrier because people think, you know, I don't speak like them or sound like them. That shouldn't be an issue. I think when it comes to women, the big issue we have is that there are lone parents and even if you want to be a counsellor, the parties expect you to campaign, they expect you to get out in the street, they expect you to walk and chat doors at night. Who's going to watch your reins? Seriously, who's going to watch yeah. your reins so that you can post leaflets? And people will watch your kids to let you get to work, to make ends meet. They're not so keen for you to, to watch your children. It's the same with branch meetings. Branch, branch meetings for a lot of political parties happen at 7 or 8 o'clock at night. And there's no links. Maybe COVID will change that. But, you know, that's a barrier. Gail Ross, she's a brilliant MSP. And I think she's so relatable. Like, she's just a good laugh. And she's just cool. And she looks amazing. She's funny. And she's stepping down because she's got a young son. And she can't zoom in. Like, hello. It's like, why? I can do this interview with you from Wishy. But mother will have moved. <laughs> one up the way, I that way. But I can do that with you, and yet there's Gail Ross resigning because she wants to see more of her son. What, what, what does that give out to women who think I'd like to have something to say, I'd like to, to have a voice, and they can't even participate because they've got barriers such as childcare and language and things like that. Yeah, no, I absolutely get that. I mean, especially in 2021, that shouldn't be a, an obstacle for any woman to, to carry on her job, should it? Something I want to discuss with you, it's, it's quite close to home, LGBT, transgender and gender uh, recognition. This subject's something extremely close to home you, Rose, isn't it? Would you be kind enough to share your story with us? Yeah, I mean, I have a child who, and actually since the big coming out story, I haven't really spoken about it. So it's quite an interesting time to, to speak about it as an exclusive Oh, so, exclusive. so Charlie was born Wesley, male gender, and went through a horrific time about age 12, 13, 14, flashing his arms, you know, all kinds of things that we just couldn't stop suicidal thoughts. We did everything and then came out and said, I, I, I'm transgender. Now, he's now 18, and since then, he feels that it possibly isn't transgender but just doesn't know right. what he is and I think what's been interesting for me in this journey is that it does seem very fluid and I used to think probably like everyone else is it fluid you know you you know who you are I knew who I fancied I, like I fancied Beckham I was young and Brad Pitt and George Clooney and quite a few others I knew and I felt very sure of that and I felt sure of my femininity Charlie came out and it was extremely difficult because he wanted to support the Thai campaign. We just love the guys there, they're just incredible. And we didn't think it was going to have the impact that it did. And actually it was great because it gave Charlie something to focus on. And now he's 18 and, and does refer to himself as he, but wouldn't regret going through the process of transitioning or learning about who he is and still to this day I would say is not quite sure who he is mm -hmm. but it definitely taught us a lot about other people too on that journey. I mean as a parent how, how, how did you handle that? Um, That's very good quick. Oh, I mean I was fine I just I, I don't know why I just had it in my gut like I think I'm kind of down with the kids like I had my children really young down with the kids makes me sound like I'm not down. <laughs> any kids um well tragic moment um yeah but i would say that i was i had my charlie when i was 21 and i had my daughter sky when i was 24 but i always knew something was different about charlie it wasn't about the fact that he ran about in nurses outfits and princess dresses which he did it wasn't that it was just a kind of gut feeling inside of me that something just felt different from what you know, I had peers with sons and they were going to football and karate and they were doing all these things. And like that would have just been his worst nightmare. What was extremely difficult, um, Charlie, Charlie's dad, who has decided never to be very public, which is I totally respect because that's his choice and he's a great father, is very religious. 
and that was something that wasn't in the paper. She's extremely religious, Christian background and Baptist background. And so that was quite difficult because I was challenged with being respectful of Charlie's other parent and this religious background, my own dad's a minister, but also being a supportive parent and saying, well, this is who this child is and the journey they're going on. It, it, it's been an eye-opening thing for me, especially with the current trans debates that are like wild in Scottish political Twitter and, and UK media, really wild. I mean, what advice would you give to any other parents that are going through similar journeys, Rosa? Well, I think you've nailed it. It's a journey. You know, don't... I think at first, one of the mistakes I did make was I was like, this is a decision now as a girl, and I was trying to adjust to just being a girl. That's not what I think gender's like. It is for me. I'm very black and white. I'm a girl, like, hello, like, flowers, like, hair. That's who I am. But for him, that's not who he is. And I feel like there is a journey. The other thing I would say for parents are, like, don't go online and read the Daily Mail. Don't go online and read The Sun. Avoid Twitter. It's not going to help you. Only three, I apologise, only three so percent of... Only 3% of Scottish people are on social media, on Twitter. So stay away from that. Seek out LGBT Youth Scotland. Seek out the guys at TIE. Inter interact with mermaids. People like that who can give you information and who can be of support. And, and don't be angry with yourself if you don't get it right all the time. Who does? No, exactly, exactly. And um, you mentioned their avoid, obviously, online. I mean, you've been the victim of online trolling in the past, Rosa. Uh, another mm -hmm. newspaper headline, just to quote an ex-SNP councillor, has been left shaken after she was sent rape and death threats online. Rosa Zamberini shared vile Facebook messages she was sent, which read, I'm going to rape and kill you, SNP scum. I mean, that is just outright disgusting and uncalled for. What, what were you going through at that time, Rosa? I mean... It's really difficult. Um, the MSP that I work for, James Dornan, is extremely vocal about sectarianism, and that particular at that particular period, he was very vocal about that, and I'm very very vocal as well. And we both had our opinions. We're not sure where it came from, but online abuse and harassment at the beginning, I just couldn't bear it. And see now, it really, and I don't mean this this ingenuously. It just doesn't bother me. I have an amazing partner and he is so affirming. I've got really good kids sometimes. Sometimes they're good kids, not all the time. But anyway, I've got great kids, good family and friends, and I know who I am. Like, I know my core. I know who I am. And I, now I can embrace it. The death and rape threats were a different kettle of fish. That's when things changed with, I use Twitter. I don't, you'll notice I don't put a lot of pictures of my children on Twitter or my partner, or we, there's no identifying. I do put a lot of selfies and things up. You wouldn't be able to identify where I live. And it also would put people off getting involved in politics. But I think for me, I'm very thankful that we've got a great police. You know, I know it sounds, that also sounds very disingenuous, but when I did get in touch with them, you know, they were really, really excellent. They did all they could. The parliament were great. They gave me a rape alarm. But here's the thing, and this is the kicker. When the, you know, last week we've had a lot of the marches for women's rights because of the real tragic deaths, and there was another one last week, a mother and daughter's remains found. A lot of my friends who aren't involved in politics were saying, well, it's not all men. My brother's lovely. My dad's lovely. You know, I've got great mates, and they would never touch anyone. But those threats nine times out of ten that I get and the abuse nine times out of ten are from men. They are usually around rape or sex or wanting to do things to my face or like not nice things. And 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 so there is that is off putting and earlier you said how do we get more women into politics? And the fifty percent of me that said I would tell people to steer away from it, it's that side of it. But the general sort of trolling on Twitter and things like that. I've got better at dealing with, I mean, I just, the funniest thing that ever happened, and this is just to lighten the mood a wee bit, um, when I was first a counsellor, I was not great with the media. Like, I was like, I just thought you just said what was in your head. I, I, like, I just like, oh, you just say what's in your head because everyone that I'd ever met said, oh, we want politicians to be like us. So I was like, well, I'll be like you. And on Twitter, I said, Oh, that's it. 
the kids are banned from reading J.K. Rowling because she said something on end day. And I was just making a joke, right? It was just a joke. And that's it. They'll never read J.K. Rowling again. Blah, blah, blah. Harry Potter is banned. Well, a journalist, Jamie Ross, who still laughs about it now, tweeted that and said, absolute scenes as counsellor bans children from Harry Potter. Then some like some mad J.K. Rowling fans picked it up and they were like, this is like a Baptist church in America. It blew out of all proportion. And I had like Harry Potter fans from Japan, from like Australia. Like they were they were like tweeting me pictures of Harry Potter with my face on them, like Hermione with me and my glasses. I'm like, oh my. and after that moment, I realized, wait a minute, this is, this is not real life. Like, so take the social media with a pinch of salt, and the stuff that's harmful, give it to the police, report it, and let them do their job. No, absolutely. And I mean, the thing is as well, these people behind a keyboard and a mouse, I mean, they would never see half the stuff to your face. If you put them behind a, a monitor, they're quite happy to type away, aren't they? Yeah, well, they certainly wouldn't say it to my face. <laughs> I'm from Russia, I'd be like all up in them like this. <laughs> but in all seriousness, no, I mean, it's hard to, to kind of take it with a pinch of salt, like you said, because it did have quite an impact on your health, Rosa, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I... The, the, the trolling was combined. There was the trolling was combined with a very difficult. I was a counsellor at North Lanarkshire Council. It was just bloody horrific. If we weren't on media, I'd, I'd swear, you know, everything that I did. So when I was at North Lanarkshire Council, they were closing a department, and I wanted to keep it open, and I was gaining traction. The way the council decided to put my gas at a peak was to insinuate I was having an affair with an officer. The officer was a married guy, a super, I won't mention his name, obviously, a super good guy, really nice guy, definitely not my type, you know, like, but the 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 fact, that was like what was happening, so we'll shut her up, we'll say she's having an affair, she looks like she's having an affair, so there was that. Then I was going through a situation which I have not spoken about publicly, but at the Scottish Parliament, where there was a harassment issue, that was happening. Then I had people on Twitter saying, look at her big lips, look at her blonde hair, look at her how she dresses. And at that point, those three things coming together made me think, I deserve this. Like, there is no place for someone like me. Like, who did you think you are? Like, get back to your job, like, go back to your life. You'd like, you're, there's no, women, no place for you, Rosa. I got so sick that they thought I'd had a stroke to this day. They still think it's a small stroke that I'd had. And, and that's when I quit because the three things together, the sexism at North Lanarkshire Council, the harassment at the Scottish Parliament, combine that with social media and everyone telling you you look like a Barbie doll, you just think, well, that, that's who I am then. That's me. That's shocking. I mean, the, the SNP, I mean, it's, it's quite a something else like it's quite in the news at the moment obviously the Nicola Sturgeon Alex Salmon situation there has been some breaking news today as we record this live obviously if when people are watching it it's not as of today but yeah. what's your take on that whole situation? I think the conspiracy theory is just wild I mean most people are kind of skipping around it it's wild it's a wild accusation Alex Salmon was found not guilty in court absolutely he has admitted to behaving inappropriately this is this is the crux of this matter and what I don't understand that the media hasn't picked up on is he went to the First Minister's house to ask her to intervene in behaviour that he admitted was inappropriate. Um, Nicola Sturgeon, I, I would say I know her reasonably well personally. She's been a super support to me. And she has always come across to me, only to me, as having an extraordinary amount of integrity, of empathy. And what I would say about Nicola is that she will not bend the rules. She has never acted in a way when I reported certain situations, and I did. I, I'm, I'm comfortable about speaking about that. I reported harassment through my employer. She never once said, right, I'm going to speak to her or try to do anything that wasn't right. It was done the way I wanted to do it. And what has Galling for me now is to see all these conspiracy theorists saying it's been this one big long setup. And I think what I want to say quite publicly that I haven't said before because even though people know it was me that complained about a government minister, I never named myself to protect me, to protect my children. 
People have said recently in some of the bloggers, well-known indie bloggers, Wings Over Scotland and others, it has been insinuated that Mark Macdonald was reported as part of a, the beginning of a conspiracy. This is not true. It's emphatically not true. Now, I don't want to go in the ins and outs of it because I really actually feel like Mark Macdonald's um, last speech was excellent. I feel he is entitled to go on and have another life and employment. However, the idea that this conspiracy started there all the way through to Alex Salmond to then Nicola Sturgeon behaving inappropriately is just ridiculous. There is no way, other way to put it. It was ridiculous. And I think I am delighted. You know, I was like, you shouldn't be delighted at something like this, but I was delighted because I knew in my heart and my core how she'd behaved with my situation. So I knew that 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 she'd be would have behaved impeccably. And I think the story should be that a former first minister asked a first minister to intervene in his behaviour. That should be the story here. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, is Nicola still the right person to lead the country, do you think, Rosa? Absolutely. Come on, bring it on. She is. I mean, she's so relatable. She's going up. The SNP are reporting that their membership numbers are, are going through the roof. They're going up. She's popular at home. She's popular abroad. She's decent. She's smart. Nicola's incredibly smart. Like, she's told me off before. Like, I've said things like, oh, and she'll say, you know what? Calm down, do this, do that. She's clever. Like, she knows her stuff. And I don't know if people, your viewers, watched the committee hearing where she spoke. Her attention to detail and her level of intellect and just that wee glimpse of humour that people can relate to is what makes her a brilliant leader. It's, she's just brilliant. And I, like people say I'm sycophantic. I, I don't even care. I'm like, you call me that if you want, because she's so good. And I think she is the person to lead us forward to an independent referendum, which is definitely on the horizon now, for sure. Yeah, no, that's my next question. When do you think that'll happen? Do you think they'll, um, we'll get an NDF2 anytime soon? Yeah, I mean, look, the pressure's on, isn't it? I mean, she's getting the pressure from those who are, there's kind of like in Scottish politics at the moment, there's this really weird kind of mixture of salmon supporters, indie supporters, they're mixing with the kind of unionist support to pressurise Nicola Sturgeon into doing something. But I think if the SNP and the Greens pull in an independent, an indie majority at Holyrood, it will be inevitable and it will be within the next year or two, is in my opinion. And James, my boss, he is like Mr. Independence. You know, some MSPs are, I think, brilliant in the SNP. They're constituency MSPs and they've got other issues. James is like, he is waving his flag. He's proud. And I, I think it is definitely coming really soon. Yeah, I mean... I Obviously, what I was going to say there was um, that the whole COVID situation, I mean, Nicola Sturgeon, she's on our telly every single day to do with the COVID-19 pandemic. She never asked for this. She's having to do a whole lot of workload that was never in the job description when she got given the first minister role. How, how do you feel she's handled the whole COVID-19 situation? Yeah, I think she's been excellent. I mean, she's had criticisms for being there every day. And I noticed, <clears throat> excuse me, some of the opposition parties said it was almost like a party political broadcast, but I disagree. I've got constituents who email me every day because the information she gives them, they have questions and then they come to us as parliamentarians and caseworkers. She's been excellent. She's been, she's apologised when she had to. She's dealt with some difficult things when the chief medical officer made a mistake. And in other situations, you know, the flu jab was a difficult time because it seemed to be rolling out quite slowly as it was at the start of rolling out the vaccine. And she's, she's been excellent, cool, under pressure, as she always is. And it is unprecedented. I think people seem, seem to forget that she's from Glasgow. She's chosen very publicly to say that she stays at home. And that, like, girl, I'm not going to joke. When does she sleep? No. She's in Edinburgh. She's like, she's there first thing in the morning. She's doing her briefings at night. And then she puts these pictures up at home, clapping for carers or whatever she's doing. And I'm like, take, take the politics out of it like pretty amazing because I'm tired and nah, I'm give, just your, give yourself a day off Nicola <laughs> yeah, like, honestly put your feet up and like chill out she likes a book I'd buy her a few 
<laughs> you mentioned you're quite, you're quite vocal on Twitter earlier on. Um, you, you tweeted something. You said if COVID was over overnight and you could go anywhere in the world for 10 days, where would you go? That was something you put on Twitter. So mm-hmm. I asked you the question, once this all blows over, if it was to disappear overnight, what would be the, the first ticket you would buy for a plane? Well, I was going to say Tuscany because I'm from it. Well, my dad's from Italy and I would go there and I'd have red wine. Oh, God, I'm getting carried away. But my best friend in the world, she lives in Dubai and I've not been able to see her for three years. She's got a little girl who started school. So I think I'd go there. Although this is the thing I was saying to my partner, like I'm tempted to book it just in case things open up. But I was, as you said, I'm a little bit lippy. I was a little bit nippy about a certain football team and their little Dubai trip. So I'm going to have to be like, really wait until it's completely safe to do that. Yeah, I think a lot of people can resonate with but Everybody's just crying out for a holiday, aren't they? Yeah, oh, definitely. And, you know, it's interesting because, I've, you know, it's so funny because I see people saying, oh, you know, stop mourning about not getting a holiday. People have died and people are ill. And, you know, people have died. People I know have died. I have friends and they've lost, one girl lost her, her dad who was a carer for her mum and tragic things. But there's nothing wrong with saying, I really need a holiday. I really need a wee break because you know what, that's what gives people, especially where I'm from in the west of Scotland and Scotland in general, the weather's not great. People enjoy that. They save up and they work hard and it's their memories. And you know, I was just saying to my sister, my daughter's 15. She's not going to want to go on holiday with me for much longer. So it's like, like I'm like, get this year. But yeah, people need a break. And they, it's all right. I also said this. This is a funny thing. I saw a lot of people. There's been a lot of like St. COVID people. Do you know the type that are like, oh, my God, I can't believe you're moaning about your wedding. Like, And actually, I think it's all right. Grief's like, you can grieve loads of things. You can grieve a holiday. You can grieve your wedding you can grieve your 21st birthday party like it's all right to say I'm like really disappointed about that don't you think so absolutely and the thing is as well having social media at your fingertips it's a good way to to go on and moan and some people like I said earlier behind the keyboard just take advantage of that and just speak a wee bit above their their podium if you like than what they would say to your face yeah absolutely and and I think Covid has been don't get me wrong at the start I've used most of my Instagram and Facebook to put out information and occasionally I was like, look guys, these are the rules and, and all that. But there has definitely been, my mother's Facebook has been a place for some interesting things to read and see. I'm like, mum, take that back down. Like you're so judgmental. And she's like, but I've been stuck in for a year. But social media does that, doesn't it? And we've all got an opinion. But I think I think it's, it's we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. I think it's okay for people to say, I'm um, gutted, I've missed this, and that to look forward to fun things again. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you mentioned earlier in the interview you've, you've got a hair salon. Is that still the case? Yeah, yeah, I do. My, um, I've got a salon. Uh, my partner and I own that together. We also own a small, it's called Soup Kachina, and it's like a, a business that's a, like soup, like takeaway with a cafe part. And unfortunately, both have had to close because of covid so that has been tough. I'm still working for James as well. So and raising children and one of them's doing exams. So it has been quite tough at times. Yeah. No, I think a lot of people as well watching this can maybe resonate with that who've owned businesses or landlords or pubs. I mean, mm. the effect has really hit more people than probably what's expected, hasn't it? Yeah, and I think that that's the thing. I think the impact for me was it was in the first lockdown, it almost felt like a novelty. Do you know that way? Like you were getting support, yep. the sun was shining, we were out the back, I was having the red wine, not when I was working for James, <laughs> but I was having the red wine, I was having, you know, there was this like kind of feeling of this is exciting, this is something we can tell our grandchildren. You know, there was that whole kind of like World War Two thing, like we just wait till I tell my grandchildren I had no toilet roll for six weeks. But then the business reopened. In fact, my business didn't reopen. Our businesses opened during COVID. It was like crazy, but that's the timing we had set. We decided to stick by it. It wasn't until we started to close again that I really began to panic because I think those who are employed are saying, well, you're getting grants and there's furlough for your staff. But the grants for most people are just covering the rent. You know, they're covering things like your Wi Fi, your all of this, if you've got rates, if you're still, if you're applicable for rates, it's covering that. 
So really taking any kind of salary out of your business is hard for a lot of people. And of course, for people like my employees who are furloughed from it, there's a financial, I've been very lucky to be able to keep all of my staff, but I've got quite a lot of young employed women in the salon whose mental health I've definitely noticed has suffered. You know, they're, they're, I, at times I'm a wee bit grumpy because they're phoning me, they want a chat, I'm still working. And in our, 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 uh, sorry, our other business, Soup Coutina, we employ lone parents. That was a part of the business. I wanted to really do that because I know what it was like trying to get a job. And they're really panicking. Will you reopen? Will you reopen? When are we reopening? Because they want their job and they want security. And I get that. Yeah, I mean, you touched on the mental health there. I mean, that's that's going to be the big impact of COVID-19, isn't it, really? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, my own has suffered at times. I, I was overthinking things. And, and at one point, I, I kept saying to my partner, who, as I said earlier, I can't speak about highly enough. Y'all know I can, I'm in love, right? Um, but he is just so supportive. And at one point, I said, right, that's it. I'm just going to shut the salon. It was the wrong time. And the reason I wanted to do that is because I woke up every day feeling anxious. It wasn't really about the salon or about working for James, but it was just this overwhelming feeling that I can't articulate. And he kept saying, let's just keep going day at a time. So we, I mean, we did things for our mental health. We are extremely fortunate we've got a spare room. So we built just behind me here, I built a gym right. and just like an at-home gym, because for me, I, that really seemed to help was exercising. Um, I read a lot of books. I phoned my boss a lot to annoy him. Like I had to do this thing every day where I was phoning him up and saying, James, do you think the world will end if we don't get a vaccine? James, do you think that if I don't get the constituent or business grant, they will hunt me down and kill me? You know, <laughs> and he was just like so patient, but everything was, I was overthinking everything. So I took steps, I exercise more, read books. But I do think there's going to be work to be done with young people and with older people. I really see it in my own mother, who's in her 70s, hasn't been out. She's lonely and I can see it and we're going to have a little bit of work to do there. Yeah, definitely. Hopefully this blows over sooner rather than later. You can get your trip to Dubai to see your friend. Yay! It's been Great a pleasure, an absolute <laughs> pleasure having you on the show, ladies and gentlemen, Rosa Zambonini. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.